All right, so welcome everyone um, to, uh, hopefully you've come to the right place. Uh, we've got today uh, Tracy Benson joining us all the way from the States and quite a few people joining us internationally as well. Uh, the talk that we're going to have today is uh, making systems thinking accessible to all generations, geographies and work groups. Um, it's part of the systems at play group. Um, so hopefully uh, you're in the right place. If you're not, you're welcome anyway, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, a little bit about us, um, about the Systems Play Group. Uh, we've now grown to, well, we've now added with this talk, a very popular one, uh, 38 new members. So thank you for joining us, all the new members. And we've reached the 200 membership um, uh, barrier. And we're probably going to crack open some champagne on the weekend and drink it individually. Uh, today we've got actually um, people from six of the continents. We've just got Antarctica to go. Um, hopefully we get somebody joining us from Antarctica and 21 different countries uh, from 48 different cities. So hopefully everybody uh, can uh, understand English, okay? Because it's predominantly going to be in English unless Tracy chucks in some, some interesting words. We'll see what happens. But welcome everyone and thanks for joining us. Um, so a little bit about systems at play. Uh, this is uh, a meetup group that we've, we formed uh, late last year. Um, and basically it came out of the, uh, the problem that we're seeing in the world of there's uh, although reductionist thinking is a great thing, being able to be analytical is also is fantastic, but we saw that as pretty much the only way of thinking that we were in a lot of spaces. So we want to actually introduce people to more different ways of thinking about things. And we also want to ourselves uh, learn more about that deep and vast space of reductionist thinking and more importantly, practical ways to apply it. Uh, it's become a bit of a passion for Mikhail, Ali, Dad and myself uh, to try and bring that now into the places that we're working and to the communities that we're in. Okay. So uh, what have we been up to? So we've had um, talks so far in November, February, March and May. We've taken a little bit of a break between May and now. Um, hope, hopefully uh, the, the months just fly by at the moment. But uh, the likes of Joan and Pauline are thinking as well. We have uh, recordings of all of those um, uh, talks as well. If you'd like to go and watch those, there's a QR code there. Uh, make sure you grab that. And I might ask Ali Dad or Mikhail to put the link to that in the chat as well, if you can. Uh, so you can go and subscribe to that. If we get uh, 100 subscribers, we get to keep the, the systems at play name in the YouTube channel. So make sure you subscribe and that would be great. All right. Uh, so what have we been up to? Well, that's the things we've been up to. So, but coming up, uh, what we've got is a, a course that we're, we're, we're um, bringing to, to the community as well on applying the viable systems model. Uh, we've also had basics and the course that's coming up uh, that we're doing on uh, in early September, the 6th to the 9th uh, is creating conditions for change. Um, that will be run in Sydney time uh, from 6 p.m. Uh, and please join us if you really love what you're hearing here. Um, this is another way to continue to explore that space with the, the lovely uh, Pauline Rock, who's joining us from the UK. Um, and that's almost it. And once again, there's a QR code there, and I think that will take you through to where you can sign up. And we're using, um, oh, what's the name of the thing? Um, what's the name of the ticketing system we're using? I think that it's um, Humanitics. Humanitics. And what Humanitics does is they give a percentage of them of what they take, uh, they're not for profit, and they put that into charities. The charity that we're using here is uh, helping uh, girls in developing countries to get the educational needs that they, they deserve. All right. About, about Tracy. Um, well, Tracy's uh, come to us from the, the Waters Centre uh, um, for Systems which is once again a nonprofit that uh, works mostly in the education space uh, and bringing systems thinking into that space uh, both community, community, for a lot of the community-based organisations. She has 25 or more uh, years um, in education, including teaching and administration uh, in early childhood and through the higher education space. She's a researcher, consultant and author uh, with several books uh, and has a commitment to ECHO the Water Centre's mission, which is to make the benefits of system thinking accessible to everyone. And I, I hope you're looking forward to the talk as much as I am. Uh, we've, we've been talking to um, Tracy and using the materials from the Water Centre for a little while ourselves, and we love it. We love it. It's fantastic. And it does exactly what the, it says on the label. It actually brings, I think, people into that space and makes it easier for them to access a lot of the systems thinking. 
And I'll throw to Tracy in just a second. Before we start, I want to let you know that the, um, the session is being recorded. Uh, please stay on mute for, for most of the session, unless you have a burning question, in which case we'll bring you in. At the end, we'll have a little bit of time for Q&A, maybe not 10 to 15 minutes, we'll see how we go. Um, please post your questions into the chat box as we go, okay? And we'll address those questions in the Q&A at the end if we can. If we can't, then we, uh, we may be able to stay back a little bit longer to answer some of these questions, or you just might um, want to catch up with Tracy at another time. And that's about it for me. So I'm gonna stop sharing and I'll let Tracy take over the share. Thanks, Tracy, it's over to you. Well, thank you so much, Dave. And I just wanna check my sound. Does my voice coming through okay? Okay. okay, and then I would be great if in chat you could just put where you're coming from. I mean, I think that would be wonderful. I did take time to look at um, all the people that signed up and what your backgrounds were and why you joined Meetup and just a, um, it's a real diverse group from people with lots of experience and also basic. So this is fabulous. Thank you. Thank you for doing that. I also really want to thank the organizers, uh, David, Mihel, and Alidad, for changing the time for me. Because right now it's 7 p.m. where I am currently in California. And, um, and I also want to note that my colleague is here with me, Sherry Marlin, who's our chief learning officer. And uh, Sherry, um, I didn't even ask her to come at seven in the night, in the evening, but she wanted to come to be able to see, learn a little bit more about um, the meetup and about the systems at play. So it appears that this is loading, 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 taking some time. Um, hmm, there we go. So, um, so Sh Sherry is going to also be helping me a little bit by putting some resources in chat when I bring things up, because our goal is to have you leave with some real practical ideas and resources, not just um, listening to a talking head. Okay, so that's that's the goal. And also to be a little playful, because I love the name Systems at Play. It's because um, play is a, is a really important part of learning. And speaking of learning, I'm going to give a shout out to Pauline Roberts and her course um, I'm going to try, I really, really want to take it. She is fabulous. Um, sign up if you can. Um, you will learn a lot. The conditions for change. She's got a terrific model and she's got a game and lots of fun. So shout out for Pauline. So let's get started by talking a little bit about, I just want to do a, a minute or two about how we got started because we're a little bit of a different organization. Uh, many people think that Water Center, that we have something to do with like H2O, but um, we, we are really named after a family. So way, way back in 1988, which is actually longer than 30 years ago, at a school in Tucson, Arizona, which is in the southwestern part of the U.S., um, it was a middle school of about 550 students. We had a neighbor move in who was a retired MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, former Dean of the College or School of Engineering, Dr. Gordon Brown. Dr. Gordon Brown is Australian. So I just have to give you know that notation that he was our very first entree into systems thinking because he said to us working at this school, I think that your students ages 13, 14, and 15 years old are capable of the same kinds of thinking that my doctoral students at MIT are doing. Are you interested in learning? And we said, how could we say no? Of course, this was a jewel that moved into our neighborhood. Dr. Brown was a, a good friend and also they mentored one another, Dr. Jay Forrester, who was at, also at MIT at the Sloan School of Business. And so the two of them talked much about the importance of young people becoming systems thinkers and also learning a little bit about system dynamics, which is, a, which is another um, entity that Jay Forrest is really considered the father of. So Dr. Forrester knew Jim Waters 
because Jim was taking classes at um, MIT. He had his degree from Columbia University, but he had conversations about Jay, about how systems thinking could be brought to young people. Jim's wife, Faith, was a retired teacher. So Dr. Brown, Dr. Forrester, and Jim Waters, and Jim Waters is an extremely successful businessman. His company, the Waters Corporation, he started with five people in a basement uh, of a, a firehouse, I believe, and it is now trading on the uh, New York Stock Exchange, I think 6,000 employees worldwide and incredibly successful business. Now, Gordon, Jay, and Jim are no longer with us, but their teachings, their mentorship, their guidance, their messages truly are the foundation of a lot of our work. And so one of those foundations is our approach to systems thinking and what we call from the classroom to the boardroom, because the, our methodologies are the same, basically, with, with slight contextual differences with four and five year olds as they are for, again, corporate CEOs, um, big time companies worldwide. And that is to first and foremost, develop a commonly understood shared systems thinking language. So it's not just the words, it's the meaning of the words and how those words apply to day-to-day -day actions and decision making. Also, a, a, a whole um, toolkit of visual tools that help people communicate, learn, and work together. So there are pictures of, of maps and causal loop diagrams and stock flows and icebergs and many of those tools that I think a lot of you know, and we'll be sharing some of those in a little bit. And lastly, it's learning by doing. Um, but we are not the kind of people that come in and do training and listen to people and then draw maps for them and say, here, is this what you think? We teach, give people, um, we don't give them the fish, we teach them how to fish, right? In terms of systems thinking. So we really help them become um, active and, and learn by doing and practicing. Um, the importance of language, um, I, well, we've had many mentors, Dennis O'Donohue, who was a retired VP of engineering from Boeing um, at one of our events. He was a speaker at one of our events called Camp Snowball, because snowball is the symbol for reinforcing scale up growth. His quote really stayed with us in that supporting healthy organizations, organizational culture, that common language that people share is, is critical. And so again, looking at that common language, I'd like to share with you a little bit of, about a case study that we did, um, that we involved, that involved the habits of a systems thinker. This is a resource that um, has been developed over several decades. Um, this is probably the fourth rendition. Uh, it is not meant to be a comprehensive explanation of everything that has to do with systems thinking. I know it had a little bit of controversy in um, the LinkedIn threads promoting this talk. And, um, and I welcome that because we, we want to learn from others. We, this is a, a work in progress. But where these words came from and these habits came from is a it's a it's it's an aggregation of research that has come from a wide range of contexts, not just schools of engineering, but work involving psychologists and family systems, work involving some of the system dynamics that are involved with environmental studies and public health, and just a wide range of contexts. And the images are meant to be stories or very short um, connected stories that help people see how these habits can be every day. Right now, there's 14 of them. Um, there used to be 12 and then another time 13. But um, Sherry, if you can put in the chat, we have digital versions of these habits in flip cards because we use, I don't know if you can see, we have sets of cards where each of these is an individual card and, and the cards are on purpose because none of these habits exist in isolation. They relate to one another, they support one another, they're connected to one another. So when they are cards, you're able to um, sort them, 
choose them, put one on top of each other, and they're just a real nice physical way to um, work on understanding the habits. So this case study began that I want to share with you began with the habits of a systems thinker. It, this um, case took place in the state of Iowa, which is dead center in the United States. It is um, a state that is very famous for its farming and especially the um, corn. And, and so silos are a real common metaphor for this state. So the early childhood system in the state of Iowa and early childhood is defined by ages birth through eight years old, um, was really concerned about the silos that were, um, that were developing over time when you looked at everyone that touches the life of a young child. So you can see that, that there are five, um, departments of ed, departments of management, human services, and so on. But I would like you, if you're, especially if you're not involved with early childhood systems, to imagine the systems that you are working with or working in right now and what those silos might be. Um, people that are, have super good intentions, subsystems, departments, teams, organizations that have their mission, that are really focused on um, a, you know, a common good or a common goal, but just seem disconnected. So what I wanted to do is to build bridges between these silos. They wanted to look at how can we take all of these efforts and begin to build an understanding of this giant, massive, complex system. And so they came to us and um, through some people that had been involved with us individually in some leadership uh, programs and they said, let's get started and begin with an initial gathering. So they invited leaders across the state from all of those different silos. And for one day, we worked on the habits of a systems thinker. You can see the people holding up cards. They were holding up habits that they felt that, they were, that, that were their personal strengths. That was one exercise. And then told stories about those habits. We taught some tools that helped them see the causal interdependencies in their system. We really all worked hard on mental models and understanding the influence that mental models have on the system using tools like the systems thinking iceberg and also the ladder of inference and also concrete strategies um, that impact the systems, job embedded strategies connected to the work that they were doing. And so some of the examples at the end of the day, it went exceedingly well. Um, so you can read some of those comments, but the most exciting part was what happened next. I'll just pause so that you can read them. So the next step was to design and to invite any of the people that were in this group and others that wanted to come but couldn't into a cohort. And it was a learning cohort where they committed to, uh, to invest time for learning at least one year. Uh, the systems thinking learning connected to building this system of early childhood understanding for the state um, on, in order to best serve young children. And uh, we began that day by looking at this really typical organizational chart, which was the structure of the state's early childhood system. And this was just projected on a screen and we gave everybody sticky dots and we said, go ahead and put a dot. The colors meant nothing, by the way. Put a dot in every piece of this structure where you either have influence or that influence you or where you feel some connection to that work. And uh, they did this exercise. We step back and you're seeing a picture as to how we were talking about the data. So what does that data mean? And, um, and had some conversations about that because it was, it, this is a new realization for them. The cohort has been incredible. And by the way, we're in, we just finished year two because they wanted to stay together and they are pretty much self-sufficient and on their own, but, um, but still it feels like family. So we continue. So the impact, and again, this is, um, you know, looking at the, the, both the impact of 
that was experienced a year ago and continues is that um, the tools and the language really made a difference. It not just made a difference for problems at work, but what we have found is that it's really important for people to see how systems thinking affects their lives. Uh, becoming a systems thinker means there's not an on and off switch. It is who you are. It becomes, the habit becomes as, as to how you actually think, whether you're trying to figure out how to work with teenagers at home, if you're a parent or guardian, it's looking at relationships, it's looking at community issues, it's looking at environmental issues, and so on. So again, using that word vernacular to help shape conversations, especially during times of racial unrest and social justice became a large part of that work, looking at children who may be in situations where they aren't, they do not have access to quality care was really important. And then lastly, um, that the cohort developed perspectives that every situation, that applied to every situation. And so again, the light bulb turned on that caused this work to continue. So, um, so Iowa was just a case study, but it did start with the, um, it, it did start with this idea of what was the perceived value of systems thinking. So I want to share with you, this is a stock flow diagram. And I don't know how many of you have experience with stock flows, but it's, it's um, a part of us. It's a system dynamics tool. Each of these blue rectangles is called a stock. And a stock is like a bathtub that it accumulates whatever it is that it's named. So the very top stock of unaware individuals is an accumulation of the number of people that are unaware. And let's say in this case, it's systems thinking. And um, there's a pipe that goes from the unaware to the aware, which is called a flow. And this flow means that when that valve is open, unaware people, something happens and unaware people become aware. So that might be like that first one day workshop that was open to anyone. So people can stay in the unaware box. They choose not to engage. They could stay in the aware box and not go anywhere. Or they could travel depending on, you know, the, the movement of the flows and the influence of those flows. They can move to the right, which is like an advocate box. And I would say all the people that signed up for that cohort were advocates. So they move from aware to advocates. Or they might be resistors. In other words, resistors might say, this is just one more thing and either I don't have time for this, or uh, it's just not my thing, or it just didn't, didn't match, it didn't fit. So the perceived value times the number of advocates equals the net value that then opens up that faucet that brings aware to advocates. And the reason why I want to share this diagram that is adapted by, by Chris Soderquist's work from Pontifex Consulting is that this really informs a lot of our approach to this work. Um, we tend to not to really focus on delivering benefits, helping people see the value for themselves in their work and their life. And we tend to, um, to look at that there is that hope and possibility that as we build the advocate stock, there are three arrows or connectors that not only affect the buy-in, they affect the net value, but they also have the potential to convert resistors. And, um, and so we pay attention to just the side of the map. We try not to change people's minds. We just let the advocates do their work, build it, and they will come just like the field of dreams. Now what happens is that over time, as the advocate stock grows and, move, and, and, and increases, the resistors choose to leave because it's not a dominant culture. So they might choose to leave. And we have seen that happen in many settings. Uh, we connect this with good old Stephen Covey and his seven habits of highly effective people saying that if we stay in this right-hand side of the map, you can grow your circle of influence over time because having concern about the resistors and not having influence on them is kind of a waste of time, a waste of effort. 
So stay on the right. And then a piece that we discovered and um, David Mahel and Aladad, I added this um, piece right before the session because it's one of my favorites, is that what we've also discovered that advocates, as they build their skill, oftentimes get promoted and move to other positions and other levels of, um, of work. And this is happening in for-profit, nonprofit, education, higher education. As a matter of fact, I, I've looked at the people that we've been working with at, at, at this le that cohort level over time, and we're at about a 75% promotion rate of the people that we work with. So there are traveler seeds, there are puffballs that end up going planting seeds in other places and they become that they take this map with them and they are the advocates and they create some awareness and and they build that that value. So I want to just pause for a second, take a breath and I did have not been looking at the chat, so I don't know if there's thank you Sherry for posting those. So Supro, you asked the question, what was the next step after the structures were identified or connection which you led the four systems of early childhood that you shared? So, um, so I'm not sure when that question was asked, but it really was the, um, the cohort. Um, because they worked and learned together, they were creating those connections themselves. It was my job to create the space for them not to tell them what to do or to, or tell them or give them any direction with that it was creating the space where they can create the connections and we can raise to a little more conscious level the actual wisdom in the group and what has happened supra is that it, this second year that was um, not necessarily planned each month we meet and people have the ability to bring a case or something that they are working on and everybody else in that group, this is via Zoom, serves as a collaborative coach. So even if they're not within that silo, they're from others, they are asking reflective questions, help people think through what systems tool would be helpful, what habits questions might be helpful, and so on. So um, they are really building those bridges and tunnels, I would say, because sometimes those relationships aren't as um, visible but it, the awareness and the, and the perception that, it's, um, that they're better together, that's another motto that they developed, has really surfaced. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy. Okay. So, um, so the habits. I, I want to be able to um, share with you the, the actual flip cards, and I'm going to ask you if you would open up a browser and I think Sherry has already put that in the chat for the one that ends with cards. And I'd like you to explore, because this is the first question I always ask when we work with new people. It's how are you already a systems thinker? And we borrow that, um, that approach from the appreciative inquiry work, where we look at really highlighting the strengths that people have and build on those strengths. And so I'll give you time to look at that. And this is what they look like um, on the website. This is a, you know, a free resource where you can, this is just an example of four of them. You flip the card and the back of the card is, um, is probably considered has the most value because it has questions that you can pose of yourself to help you practice that habit. And also there are some systems thinking tools on several or more than several of them that using the tool is another way to be able to practice that habit. So these are flip cards. And this is the back. This is an example of questions to ask. Um, and um, and uh, again, we've been working on these. These questions are, are used in um, in meetings and collaborations, people bring their cards, they, or they use this digital format and say, what habit should we really be focusing on right now? And what questions should we be asking? So asking those open-ended questions that don't have leading answers is, we believe is a really important um, aspect of being, of being a systems thinker. 
And so, um, so when you choose scan the cards, we ask you, just like I did with the Iowa folks, to uh, choose a personal strength. And we ask people to choose one and be ready to tell a story of how you put that habit into practice recently. And the reason we think story is so important is that that is the evidence that supports people's self-assessment. Um, stories are um, wonderful qualitative measures to look at, um, you know, again, how people self-assess themselves, how they might self-assess their team, how they might self-assess their organization. And so those are important. So what I'd like you to do in chat is when you have chosen your strength, if you can just put some key words of that habit into chat and we can begin to see um, what comes up for this group. So I invite you to do that. There's, it, it, I am really, this is, I'm, I give people much more time to do this, believe me, you know, it's, but, uh, so I understand that if it's, the, these are new to you, um, it may take some time, but which one kind of speaks to you? And what we tell people as you're scanning the cards, if you don't understand what one means, don't worry about it, just put it to the side. Just pick the one that is like, yes. So Paul, thank you, considers an issue fully and resists the urge to come to a quick conclusion. That one, Paul, is the one that I work on the most. That's my area of growth. And Sherry, meaningful connections. I know Sherry, I work with Sherry, I know that that's her favorite. And Ross, changing perspectives. And Miriam, changing perspectives. Thank you, changing perspectives. So changing perspectives, that particular habit is one of my personal favorites as well because it is much more than empathy. It is, are you willing to leave your own perspective and see the system through another's eyes? Are you willing to get in someone else's shoes and really understand, even if you totally disagree with them, can you see it through their eyes and through their perspectives to gain a better understanding? So I see big picture and structure. This is great. So thank you for that. So then the next step is, you know, if we had the time and if this was an actual workshop, we would get in breakouts and you would share your story of how you put that into practice. And we would see through those stories that lots of habits would be coming in uh, into those stories, not just only one. Um, and so, uh, so I invite you to, to do that exercise, you know, with family members, your team, whatever, use these digital cards ask for their strengths and, um, and a story to support that. So besides just asking for strengths, there are other questions, and these are just examples that, um, that, that where these are used in, um, in work that similar to Iowa and other places, and this happens not just in you know, education, but in lots of different contexts. Uh, so which habits are growth areas needing attention? You know, I shared with you that resist the urge. I, when I am working in, with educators, I feel like there's this urgency to serve children or this urgency to give people joy in the workplace. So we got to do something, right? But I have to like pause. So to ask that question of us, our team, our organization. Then which habits will be important for us to practice as we, and this is situational, as we deal with a situation? What might be the unattended consequences with, of this action? What might be the time delay that we need to pay attention to in order to, before we actually see an outcome and a result? Can we be patient enough to, to experience that time delay? So with decisions, new policies, programs, that uh, it's, these are really good tools to use in being able to take that pause. Also, they help you engage other stakeholders, new customers and clients, and also competitors. I'll be talking a little bit about the wisdom. Uh, Jim Waters has been my mentor and guide for a long, long time. We, um, he 
passed away unexpectedly in May. So I'm going through the mourning process. So I'm going to be giving his wisdom, sharing his wisdom and passing it on to you. But he told us that you need to engage with your competitors, with the people that are your uh, the people that are um, adversary seem seemingly adversaries to your work because that's where you're going to learn you're going to learn because they're going to do it better than you and that's where you want to learn it if you're going to be successful in scaling this work you've got to be open to that the other is um, when you're hiring new people to first look at based on this position what kinds of thinking what kinds of habits of a systems thinker would be important for this person and then use some of those questions in the back or variations of them in interviews, because then you can begin to see that. So, um, so that's just some examples to kind of get you thinking about how to, um, to use these um, habits. Uh, one of our longtime collaborators, uh, Peter Senge, who in 1990 wrote that seminal book, The Fifth Discipline, The Art and Practice of Learning Organizations. Peter's work was very involved with business. Actually, Jay Forrester was Peter's teacher or one of his most influential teachers. And uh, back in 1990, he visited that school or actually 1992, he visited that school that I showed you on the very first um, slide to learn because he had heard through Jay that we were doing things with kids and he said oh this is kind of interesting and and that really got him started in um, his interest in bringing this work to younger people and he wrote um, other books like schools that learn and has been involved with a, a number of education and environmental efforts but this is a picture of an elementary school another school because we grown and were lots of different schools that he was visiting that we were in and one of the the students in the school um, thought it was pretty cool that he was there because her mother was a fangirl of Peter and so gave him a hug and got a picture. Um, oops. And so I, we want to give you this resource that um, is new and was recently developed for the habits and uh, what we did was to take the questions on the back of each card, and this screenshot is just two of the habits, but to ask yourself, and if you're, especially if you're a consultant or if you're coaching or if you're collaborating, are we talking about something by reflecting on what has happened previously? Or is the focus of our conversation on something that's happening now? Or are we doing more aspirational work and envisioning for the future? So quite simply, besides changing the verb tense and a few other aspects of the questions, this can help you focus on what, what time frame you are exploring in, in order to better understand a system and to practice it in that. So this is a several page document. Um, I think if we put it in the chat, you'll be able to download it. If not, it's on our website and we'll give you the URL for that. And um, Sherry, if you're able to do that at some point, that would be terrific. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, more of our methods um, is uh, that we really, really believe that shared understanding is through shared experiences. And so being playful I already mentioned we use stories a lot, but we also love cartoons because they serve as metaphorical, safe um, images that can make you laugh, but can also lead to some real serious conversations as you make connections. We also are a firm believer in experiential learning and giving people exercises. Virtually, it becomes a little difficult to do that, but we do, and I'll show you how in a, in a little bit. And then also debriefing those experiences to help people make those connections to life and work. So cartoons, I'm gonna just share, I think, I think it's just one of them. I have a whole bunch of these, but, um, so this is one of my own personal favorites because it looks at the giraffe seeing the system from up above. It kind of challenges that notion of that 10,000 meter or 30,000 meter view of seeing things from above or from a balcony view because when we're up there, we do see the system, but we also can miss some things. 
missing by seeing and experiencing the system at different levels. And so what habits can help us see more than the red hat? Um, I, I look at, I, I, this is a very short story, but I, when I was a school principal, one of the most influential people in our school was our school custodian or a janitor. He wanted to be called custodian because a custodian is one who cares for, just like a custodial parent. And he said, it's my job to not just care for the facility and the physical plant of the school and grounds, but I see the system from a way different view than teachers and administrators and other personnel. I see students when they come off the bus. I see them sitting by themselves in the cafeteria when they're lonely. I see teachers when they're stressed or when they're joyful. And, and so that view really helps me see that. Um, Miguel was invited to every single strategic planning, retreat, and, and such because his view of the system was critical to the work that we were doing and the goals we were setting. And the kids named the soccer field after him, or the football field, I should say, uh, because he was so well loved. Learning by doing, playful low rest experiences. Again, debrief those with open-ended questions. And the art of a debrief, the art of a debrief is really the skills that, um, that I think are critical to some of the systems thinking exercises that are out there. To be able to ask a question that you don't have the answer in your head, that you're not trying to lead people to, really brings out the wisdom in the group. It raises the consciousness of the insights that people didn't even know they had and, and bring those to the light of day. And then those experiences, you can refer back to them. So I've referred back to those silos a bunch, you know, so referring back to the experiences and to the metaphors just really trigger for people um, memories that can make lots of sense and also gain that deeper, um, that deep, lead to deeper conversations. And then of course, using the systems thinking tools to draw, map, past, current, and the aspirational dynamics of the system. And so we use Linda Booth Sweeney's systems thinking playbook, Linda Booth and Dennis Meadows. Um, it's a great book um, that you can get on Amazon. Um, and, and, and other resources as well. On our website, we also have some other um, facilitator uh, guides that are other experiential ex exercises that we've developed over time. And since COVID started, we have developed a toolkit. So when people sign up for our forums, our workshops and su such, we physically mail them a toolkit. We think that having things in your hands, like a slinky and, and a mirror and a rubber band, all of those have exercises that go with it. And, um, and also some laminated sheets with a dry erase pen and things that they, can, that they use throughout the experience. We feel like the toolkit is an important part of virtual learning. I, I, in the description of this um, talk, I talked about different contexts. So we're, we've grown over the past, I would say, seven years, six, seven years into a lot of different other arenas besides the education or the pre-kindergarten to secondary education. Um, this book is recent. It's um, published by the American Medical Association and it's used by a wide number of medical schools throughout the U.S. and my understanding is outside of the U.S. as well. There is a chapter that has case studies that matches our cards, the actual Habits of a Systems Thinker cards, to entice people to look at those cases with a systems thinking lens. Um, AMA also has some courses online where one of their competencies is to encourage people to understand and be able to apply the habits of a systems thinker. Corporations, we've worked with a number. One of our earliest was General Electric where we helped um, develop their advanced management leadership course which is taught worldwide. Um, GE, we, GE was one of our best customers in buying the systems thinking habits cards and um, they're, they're in, in every country that they have uh, corporate training. 
Um, the humanitarian relief, Sherry, my colleague, is working with the AL, ALNAP. Education, hard to choose just one. I mean, hundreds of schools, both with primary, secondary, and higher ed, um, and not just US worldwide. Um, and a number of nonprofits, the United Way is a big nonprofit in the US, public health institutions. And one fun story, just this afternoon, I had a meeting with an engineer, the professor of engineering who had a sabbatical working with SpaceX, helping them um, take their specialties and be able to be better at working together because they weren't in some cases in, in part of the rocket that they were developing, each specialty came together and they were just, they just had a, a little bit of trouble working as humans in, in being able to share their expertise and their, and their specialties. So Ricardo was working with them and brought our cards. He said, Tracy, we need help. Sherry, we need help. And so they used the cards and used some of the physical activities to try to, to overcome some of the gaps in order for them to get that rocket working. So let's do, I think, let's see, I'm looking at the time. Um, we're going to do a four minute exercise because I, I just want us to have some fun. So this is a short one and this helps us practice this particular habit card. And I want to define mental models. This is Peter's definition, but they're kind of like the glasses from which you see the world. And the glasses are based on your experiences, your culture, how you were raised, your education, your whole, your whole life really influences how you see the world. So you're going to need a scrap piece of paper and a pen or a pencil, something that you can just write on really quick. And here are the directions. This is a top of the head, what comes to mind exercise. I'm gonna say a word and you're gonna write down as quickly as possible the first word that pops into your head. You're not gonna think about it. This is instantaneous. This is like nanoseconds. We're actually gonna do this only three times and then we're gonna debrief, okay? Ready? The first word, sail. Sale. I will say each word two times. The second word, waste, waste. And the third word, weak, weak. Okay, pencils down. <laughs> so for the first word was sale. I'm gonna show you a picture and in chat, I want, and they're numbered one or two, I want you to write down the picture that closest resembles what came to the top of your head. A one or a two. So we have a mixture. We have a mixture, okay. So I want you to think about what caused, what about your recent experiences or where you live or whatever, that caused that picture to pop into your head. Just think about that. The second word was waste. Let's put the number in, ready? Waste. Which number? So a lot of, a lot of ones, a lot of garbage and waste. So there could be some, uh, you know, I was thinking about this because these are all homonyms. They're words that sound the same but are spelled differently and mean different things. So I never really know culturally, if, you know, how this is gonna work, if, if those words work for all places, but we'll see. You'll give me feedback on that. Think about where that came from, that, that picture that popped into your head. And the last one was weak, weak. Yeah, so a combo, one and two. Terrific. So really quick exercise, and here's the debrief. Here's what I want you to think about. And if we were in a workshop setting, we would just have lots of conversation about that. But I asked you to think about the personal experiences that influence your response and what when you heard each word. So do a little self-analysis. Like if it was sale, did I just go shopping for back to school if school is about to start? Or Am I, do I live near the coast and I love to watch the sailboats? 
Then think about, and I'd like you to share in chat, this is the key for this exercise. What words might you or others be using with colleagues, clients, learners that you might be working with or stakeholders that may be interpreted in different ways depending on people's backgrounds and experiences? What are the words that we use? Systems thinking is one. But what are words that you use that mean different things to different people? Thank you, Eladad. Yes, collaboration. Safety. Thank you, Miriam. Yes, development, agreement. Yes, innovation. <laughs> done. Yeah, are we done? What does finish mean? Yes, communication. Yeah, system. Thank you. So it's paying attention to the words that are used where we make assumptions that people are on the same page and really surfacing that. Danella Meadows says to, to bring those mental models of those words to the light of day, to expose those to others in order for us to, to better understand what we're talking about. And so on the back of the mental model card, there are questions that I'd like you to ask yourself. And I think I saw in chat, I think it was Supra that said, one of, this is the, one of my favorites, which is the third one in this card. How could my own mental models be barriers to what I'm trying to achieve? I ask myself that almost every day. Is that the, um, you know, that it starts with, it starts with yourself. And how do these questions inform your efforts to increase access and interest in systems thinking? So start with yourself as you're thinking through this. So I'm going to share one other cartoon that is, this is again, my all time favorite, so favorite that I paid $50 to be able to use it. So it's about the power of mental models to ask yourself, what are your rhino horns? And this is not just a negative thing. This could be my rhino horn might be, I always want to see the best in people. I always want to see the best in people. And it influences everything that I see. But I use this cartoon with groups when we're working on mental models and asking them that and to really have some deep conversations about that, you know? So there are some of the responses that have come up with groups is uh, bias. You know, the biases that I hold are my rhino horns. Some of it is my view of systems thinking is this, this, and this, and all other views, I don't even see them. That's what I, that's, that's the influence there. So I'm, I'm seeing in chat that you like this and, and I do too. Yeah, thank you, Paul, about heuristics, past training, you bet, you bet. So you think about what your rhino horns are, and I, that's why I just love this cartoon. And so um, across geographies, I promise that I would share a little bit of that too, that we're in 80 countries and counting, and I'm so impressed with the systems thinking of play that you're already up to 29 because we've been doing this a lot longer. And so you're just on the on the road. Your behavior over time graph is just shooting up there. Uh, but what's exciting is that we're also doing we're investing a lot in uh, translations. And this is uh, this is a beginning start. But right now we have Spanish and Italian and Japanese. And also um, Sherry, my colleague, is doing work. Um, in Afghanistan with um, virtually with some groups that are really trying to bring education to women and um, in, who are educators. And so we have these in Dari and Miriam is here with us today. And Miriam is one of three that are working on a German translation for us. Yay, Miriam. And uh, that came from um, a volunteer. So uh, that asked us to be able to um, to, that he wanted to help. So those are translations, tools. I'm kind of got like, I think about another minute or two. Um, so I want to share with you, I, I always believe in bringing children into the room. 
So this is a situation where these three boys in a school were having horrible problems on the playground. Parents were very upset that the teacher wasn't dealing with them. This was one of our demonstration sites. And the teacher said to the parents, the boys have the tools, let's let them figure it out. She gave them space. And this is what they drew on the paper that you're seeing on the table. I happened to walk by and she said to me, Tracy, can you just go and just listen to what they're saying? And I said, can I film them on my phone? They said, she said, ask them, see if they say yes. If they say yes, sure, go for it. She was frustrated. So um, this is what they had, a reinforcing loop about mean words, hurt feelings, but it's, this is one minute long. It's been, a, it's gone, this video is very old. It's been viral. It's been shown in so many different adult conferences and keynotes and such. I just wanted to share it with you if you haven't seen it. These are six-year-olds. And our reinforcing loop is about when we get mean, we get mean words, hurt feelings, mean words, hurt feelings, and we get fights. We get mean words again and hurt feelings, and then, and then, and then we thought about some ways to break the loop. Mm -hmm. We thought about all of our ways to to break the reinforcing loop, but we tried this. This is crossed out. We saying I'm sorry kind of worked, but we haven't tried these out yet. But the next time we get in a fight, we're going to try to um, try it. What would the behavior over time graph look like for this reinforcing loop? First, it would look like, or here's good and bad. It would be, it would be, and then, and then we'd get hurt feelings and mean words. We'd keep going like this. And then one of the, and then one of the leverages would make us go down. If this reinforcing loop said um, n nice words, hurt nice feelings, we could get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of these, and change them to something that's not bad, change it to something that's good, that will keep the loop going. Okay, so, um, so that um, effort that they did then went on to, whoops, didn't want to do that. Um, went on to uh, the, the, those loops were posted, teachers in different classrooms used them, children did an audit of kindness in the school, and then it grew from one school to multiple schools to now this example has been all over. And kindness is something that I think the world, our world really needs right now, and to reinforce that, and I think the kids um, can kind of help us see that. So, um, so the these boys are now, I don't know, high school or college, but they've really made a difference for so many. Um, so have older students. This is a secondary student. You know, you can see that the maps get more complex. Um, this leadership group um, presented what they thought the leverage um, action should be in order to build student success in their school district. Um, and and um, and the, the, board, the governing board of this district listened and they were like, wow, unbelievable. Kids are just capable of so much. And this is a fun one that they did. You know, the reinforcing on the left is part, the more fun a party is, the more friends join. But the balancing loop is then people eat more food, the food's gone, attendance goes down. So uh, the kids have fun with this as well. So um, anyway, I... Uh, our kids grow up to be emergency medical um, doctors. And this Nat Johnson spoke at our health systems forum about what he learned in middle school and the high school and how he's taken that to the ER. His message is nurses understand the system and doctors need to listen to them because they are they're about patient care. And so anyway, I am gonna causality, shout out to causality. If anybody wants, to, so I and I know that we you have to go, Dave, and and I'm um, ending, so I'm going to just stop share. I think for now, you've got a lot of resources, and I had way too much, but thank you so much, uh, Tracy. That was awesome. Uh, we'll lose a couple of guys, guys, short on the dot, but uh, Tracy, thank you so much for that. I mean, with the kids, I almost cried for that one. <laughs> That heart, well, um, heartwarming. Um, 
any questions, guys? Any questions before we, we part? We still have some time. Of course, we're just on the hour, but um, I think uh, Tracy would still for a while uh, to answer any questions. Yeah, for me, um, I was interesting in the uh, translation bit. Uh, I have someone back in uh, where I come from, from Macedonian. Wonder if I can translate into Macedonian. Yeah. So Miriam, you have your hand up. Yeah, I have a question, and I'm not sure if it fits, and it's maybe a mental model of mine. But what was your hardest sell? You know, when like where there was the most resistance, but it eventually happened. Oh, you know, Sherry, you should think about this question too. Um, so, so I'm going to say secondary and higher ed. When you're dealing with specialists who are experts in their field, it's sometimes really hard to help them see greater systems. We're working with some medical schools right now, and um, and they are seeing that very much so when you have a specialist who is focused on one part of the body and doesn't necessarily recognize the impact on the other parts of the body. I mean, that seems sounds really simple to us, right? But <laughs> it's when you're an expert, it's sometimes you miss it. So I don't know, Sherry, do you have? I think you nailed them. I mean, I do think that. Um, and if you think about secondary education, at least the way we do it in the United States, we make it very siloed intentionally. And so then it's more difficult for people to see these integrated ideas of systems thinking. Yeah. And I think that's why our preschool teachers, I mean, we do this work in, for four-year-olds with four-year-olds, that, that the learning is about, it's not about maths and science and reading, and it's about, you know, ex observation and seeing those connections. And so we kind of teach it out of them a little bit. They're like natural systems thinkers. So um, sometimes disciplines can do that. Thank you for your question, Miriam. Paul, you had a question. Hi, Tracy. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for your time today. That was uh, that, that's really amazing stuff. Uh, I hope this one isn't too sticky a question, um, but uh, and, and I'm I'm only just getting into systems thinking and, and complexity. So forgive me if it, if it's a bit naive. Also, um, how do you rationalize that we're dealing with complexity and using systems thinking to um, uh, work with it with complexity but we're using an iceberg model that is a little bit linear in that we've got mental models building upon structures um, how do you rationalize that how can you um, help me with that well it's not so the the all models are wrong and some are useful right um, ah. that I love that phrase and so the iceberg does have a lot of um, problems with it um, we don't necessarily always, when we do the iceberg, we don't necessarily start at the top or start at the bottom. We, we have about 12 different versions of the iceberg that is a tool to fit whatever um, we might be using. So um, we mix it up and take liberties to do that. Um, within the structure level is where I, and metal model level is where I think we deal mostly with um, trying to delve into that idea of complexity. Complexity would be one of those words that I think mean different things to different people. So we would, would wanna try to um, unfold that a bit as well. The other piece, I pulled out some things out of the toolkit, but we, we've we made 3D icebergs because you can hide mental models. Um, we have, so we try to make things a little bit more tangible with that. Uh, and I don't know if I'm really, un answering your question correctly, but um, it's, uh, we, we don't pretend that any of the tools that we use accurately represent the system. They represent your perception of the system. And when people work together and it generates those conversations where people perceive things differently, it's, it can be really, really helpful. So, so uh, they're tools to work with the system of interest um yeah i mean it's it, it, we 
I think one of the hardest things for people that are in the learning phase is what tool would best help me in this situation? And, um, and it's an and it's experimental thing. I mean, it's through, um, it's through practice and what works. And, and, and what we say is, was it helpful? Do, what is your desired outcome here? And work backwards. And was it, was it helpful? Um, so whether it's a connection circle or a causal map or a causal loop archetype, or the ladder of inference is one of uh, that one has gained so much popularity and if you don't uh, chris argus's work is um is really credible on um, and again you'll see a lot of the renditions of those tools um we have on our website the thinking tool studio it's a free collection of resources where there are templates and little mini basic courses and um all kinds of things so paul i don't know if i've answered your question but I, th I think so, Tracy. I, th I think um, I think you've said that there's there's lots of different tools we can bring to mm -hmm. to gain an understanding, and so that um, it I saw it more as a, before my question I was thinking it as a rigid tool. It isn't. You've got lots of variations on it that we can use to try and help us. Absolutely, absolutely, and we and we love entrepreneurship within this work. I mean, we just don't feel like there's right and wrong answers. I mean, some of our mentors in the past did tell us that 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 was wrong, but we just didn't really, we just said, well, but it was helpful. It helped kids, it helped adults. And so we just went with it and, mm. and, um, and, and became innovative. One of Jim Waters quotes is, uh, be careful not to fall in love with your favorite solution. When you fall in love with your favorite solution, you're going to limit yourself. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so he, he told us that all the time. So you don't fall in love with the iceberg. If you fall in love with the iceberg, it's going to limit yourself. You know, look at it in a different way. <laughs> Thanks for that. I think I needed that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gene? Have you ever set the iceberg model beside the ladder of inference and pondered the two of them together? We actually um, use the ladder of inference in the iceberg. So we... we um, okay. It is a part of that. Um, as a matter of fact, we see mental models as structure, um, as a part of structure, and we use the the um, the ladder of inference to help people surface the mental models of different stakeholders, and and where those mental models came from, what about their experiences, because we have to understand that. So that's a part of that whole lower level. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for asking that. Magic. Uh, any more questions, guys? <laughs> any more questions? Um, hope Tracy will have you uh, over for something more along these lines further down the track. Uh, as we discussed, we would love to see you again as well. Yeah, and this was, but this is just, I just want to thank you. This opportunity is just really, I just feel I'm humbled and really appreciate it. So thankful. Thank you um, for everybody for coming and especially to my colleague, Sherry. Working overtime. <laughs> yeah, as uh, as mentioned, guys, we'll post this on uh, on YouTube, so it'll be a couple of days before we uh, kind of cut it and post it there. But it'll be available there. Plus, uh, a lot of links that we have here, we'll also put them on YouTube. So, uh, yeah, if uh, you need anything else in addition to that, please feel free, reach out via the um, Meetup channel, or uh, yeah, directly. So. Thank you so much to everyone. Thank uh, thanks for Thank attending, uh, and uh, I'll we'll see you next time. Thank you. Okay, Stay guys. Stay in touch. Stay in touch. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.